and they were married at long last. Yay! Who knew that all it was going to take was a rap battle? <music> Greetings, travelers. Welcome back to Tales from the Enchanted Forest with your animal companions, Fox and Sparrow. Shalom! If you've been following us on Twitter and Instagram at Tales from the Enchanted Forest, then you will know that we have traveled all the way to the end of the Persian Empire to bring you this story. This is pretty far out. I've never been out this far before, but I am loving it so far. It's doing wonders for my feathers here. But your fur is looking great today, Fox. <laughs> That's what happens when you're at the end of a great dynasty. Yep, yep. I hope nothing bad happens. So our story today, the story of Khosrau and Shireen, is one of the most popular Persian love stories. It is based on the real-life Sasanian king Khosrau II of Persia and his queen Shireen from the 6th century AD. The story was fictionalized by Nizami Ganjavi. Ganjavi is a great romantic Persian poet from Azerbaijan who is known for his works such as Leila and Majnun and Khosrau and Shireen. This story was popularized by Nizami, but he had many great literary inspirations. Ferdowsi Shahnameh has a brief history of Khosrau and Shirin, but mainly focuses on Khosrau's battles. Arabic author Khalid bin Fayoz also wrote a love story that is very similar, and Fakhir al-Din Gurgani also wrote a famous story called Viz and Ramin, which is considered a great influence for the basis of this poem. It's amazing how... Such a story has made its way through the ages. You said it was originally based on a real person, which I think is a new one for us. And then it was adapted and then readapted. And now we finally get it here. I know I read the translated version. You also read the translated version. So it's been through a lot to get to our forest today. It has. I feel like a lot of these stories go through so much. And throughout time, they get changed. They get adapted. Different cultures influence them. Different people write about them, and every different every retelling tells a different story, um, and they always chip away a bit at the original. So it's hard to say what the overall story of Khosrau and Shireen was because we have a very adapted, translated version of it that we are reading today. Yeah, it's essentially the biggest game of telephone ever, and I am here for it. I am also here for it. I'm not sure if many historians, classical writers, or translators are here for it, but at least we're enjoying ourselves. <laughs> we're enjoying ourselves, and uh, dear listeners, we're doing our best to give you the most accurate version that we have, but we understand that we're essentially still playing a game in this broken telephone. So we hope you enjoy it today and continue to play the game with us. We'll start our story today with Prince Hosrao being punished by his father. You see, his father, the king, had just enacted a new law that promised his subjects protection from the destructive nobles. And what did Khosrau do right after? He had taken over a farmer's house for a night of partying and accidentally caused a stampede over the farmer's crops. As punishment, Khosrau had been removed from his throne. But, you know, he repented and eventually he was forgiven. There was nothing Zuko-esque about it. He just offered to be executed and the king decided that was enough to show repentance. <laughs> Like, really? You just have to say you're sorry and be like, I guess I'll sacrifice myself. And it's like, oh, he's learned his lesson. What a good kid. Well, to be fair, his father kind of went very hardcore. The servant that caused the stampede was given over to the farmer as a slave. Ugh. And Christophe's throne was also given to the peasant <laughs> to be used by him. Uh, so, I mean, I guess Christophe was like, I'd rather be dead than to face this humiliation. What a day for that peasant though you're like excuse me he just killed my crop and he's like okay do you want to rule the country <laughs> and didn't all of his friends as well get punished like in various very cruel ways yeah i mean the king had just made this law into a thing and he was kind of annoyed because it had just been enacted so they were like everyone be very careful about this and to show his people that he was serious about it and serious about them and to you know maintain their loyalty he had to have serious repercussions for it so I guess it was wrong place, wrong time kind of situation. I think we're off to a really good start. It seems like we've got a really smart protagonist here, clearly <laughs> showing all the best virtues and just decision-making skills. Nothing could go wrong going forward with our story with a character like this. While the night of his forgiveness, Christophe's grandfather and namesake came to him in a dream to get promise him four guarantees in life. Christophe. My grandson, I am so proud of you 
for breaking all the rules and then not dying is very impressive. And you have a fantastic name, by the way. It's just so good. So, in recognition of all of your excellence, you will ride Sabdis, the fastest steed. You will sit on Takudis, the throne of thrones. And the musician, Barbath, shall play for you. And above all, your destined love, Shareen, will be yours. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Everything seems to be looking up for the prince. As he's enjoying the company of his friend, the artist Shapur, his friend recounts his journey to Armenia and mentions the queen's beautiful niece, Shireen, and her stallion, Sabdiz, the fastest steed in the world. Now, where have I heard those names before, Kostao Thing? And sends Shapur at once to bring him Shireen because dating is hard when you live hundreds of thousands of miles away from the people you want to meet. You don't even have video chats, phone calls. You're relying on someone to pass a message and not dying along the way to pass your message along, being like, I think you're pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I well, can't see it right now. I think you're pretty. He hasn't even seen her yet. He's just heard his friend tell him that she's really pretty. So I guess it's like, Back before you had things like Tinder or dating apps, you just had to take people's word for it and go on a blind date. But this is really now, extreme to go on a far date. I mean, is there really no one else around you could consider? Nope. Okay. Well, I mean, we think there's something wrong with this, but Shapur thinks there's nothing wrong here, and he heads out. When he arrives, he finds out that the royal party likes to sit near a very specific lake. So being the clever painter he is, he paints a portrait of the prince and leaves it for them to find. Now, it's not a magic painting, but it is important to note that Shapur is an exceptional artist and his painting bewitches Shireen. The other members of her party do not trust this mysterious painting and rip it up. However, Shapur just returns and leaves more portraits. Shireen is infatuated with the handsome prince at the prospect of this random painting that keeps appearing at her lake. Eventually, Shapur does reveal himself and tells her about the man in the painting that Shireen has fallen in love with. He devises a plan with her to help her escape to Persia. She asks the queen to let her take Shabdiz on a hunt, and then flees with Khosrau's seal so she can identify herself when she meets him. Ingenious. Genius, to be sure. This wouldn't be a poem if there wasn't some misdirection. And it has been said that never before have lovers traveled so far for each other, only to never meet. Shireen <laughs> runs away to Persia to see Khosrau, who at that exact moment is on his way to Armenia after a political falling out with his father. They do meet each other at one point when Shireen is bathing in a lake, but neither recognizes the other, and they are both embarrassed by this encounter. Shapur seems like a really good friend in this situation. You know, you just got back from traveling, and you tell your friend, like, dude, it was crazy. The place was so much fun. I had all this great food. It was, it was long, exhausting. I'm glad to be home. But there was also these pretty people. Whoa, 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 dude, 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 dude. There was a pretty girl there. Can you can you get her, her number for me? But I have to go all the way back to that country to get her number. <laughs> but but I want her number. Can I have it? Can I have her number? Can I have it? <laughs> this was the, the influence of that sketch. <laughs> yeah. It's little known facts. Just dropping nuggets here like this. But yeah, I think he's a champ for actually going along with it and also just being a good painter friend. He's an underrated character in the story, to be sure. You, you have to like believe that he's getting some kind of payment from the royal family I just for being, so. for being Khosrau's friend, because otherwise he's spending his entire year going back and forth between these countries. Yeah. And of course, I, I am a big fan, to say, of the they just missed each other kind of idea, you know? I love it in comedies, especially. They're all walking around the same building going, where are they? And they just pass each other. It's frustrating and hilarious all at once. I had a kick out of reading this. Other artists and storytellers will agree with you because this moment where they just see each other and don't recognize each other at this lake has been immortalized in so many different tapestries, artworks, miniatures. It is a very, very famous scene because it shows that they... It's almost like destiny where they were fated to always be apart. I think you're right. It is a very cute moment and it really symbolizes this idea of coming so close to something that seems like it's fated to do so. 
but it never really quite clicks. And it, it's it's both beautiful and really tragic moment. So I can see how a lot of artists would want to paint that moment and just kind of capture that feeling. It's also the feeling of being close to something, not knowing what you've just missed. Because mm. I think throughout the story of Kostao and Shirin, they always just miss each other or they always there's always a misunderstanding. There's always someone else. There's always something that keeps them apart. And in this moment, they could have basically they could have just been together from that point on but because they don't recognize each other because there's no chance for them to really identify the other person it's a missed connection moment and i remember reading the story of Pastao does think about you know this beautiful woman he saw and she does kind of think well is this Kostao that I saw? Is that maybe him? But because they're in different disguises, Kostao is not wearing his traditional colors. Sheen is, you know, naked because she's bathing. There is that layer of their identity that's been stripped from them. And so when they see each other, they don't know each other. That's very tragic. But also, I'm not sure how tragic it is because I'm not sure how much I root for this prince who's just decided <laughs> to trample a farmer's random crops and for no no real reason. Just because it wasn't really his fault i mean you know they took yeah. over the farmer's house and it was his servant that accidentally caused the the stampede i mean at the end of the day he was the one that chose to stay at a farmer's house after a hunting party and he takes on the repercussions of that i'd like to see the world where the that peasant went on just to be king and see how that went for them <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about that weird encounter, Shireen makes her way straight to Kostao's palace and waits for him because she hears from the newly returned Shapur that he had run into Kostao in Armenia and he was waiting for her there. So they both set off to Armenia together, leaving the steed Septis behind for Kostao in the meantime. Now, Kostao is in Armenia, but he has just found out his father has died and leaves to go back to Persia for his coronation. Kostao barely gets to enjoy his return when his rival spreads rumors about him and turns the people's opinion. Kostao is forced to flee again and makes his way back to... You guessed it! Armenia! Yay! The two meet at last and are overjoyed. The Armenian queen throws great feasts for them, but she does warn her niece not to trust Kostao's love blindly and wait for their marriage. Kostao tries to seduce her, but Sheen cleverly tells him to protect their honor and secure their future, and then she will be his. Kostao is a crown prince, and they weren't known for their loyalty towards women, generally, so I think the queen's words of advice here are very important because she tells Sheen, you know, hold off, wait until you're married, wait until you're guaranteed to be his forever mm -hmm. before you go off and, you know, just become his for a night. And I think this really touches Kostao because he's not used to, you know, not getting what he wants. So for him, it's a moment of, well, I want her. I've traveled all this way. I've come all the way here and I'm being rejected. And this spurs him to take her advice. And he rides for Constantinople to ask for help from the Persian enemy, the Byzantine emperor. The emperor promises to help on the condition that Kostao marries his daughter, Miriam, and take on no other wives. Kostao is kind of between a rock and a hard place. If he says no, he loses out on having someone help him to actually take back his kingdom. If mm -hmm. he says yes, he can no longer marry Shireen. The stakes are a little bit different because it's his entire kingdom versus a girl. So he does, he does agree, and together they march on Persia and reclaim the throne. In the meantime, Shireen's aunt has died, and Shireen has become a great but very unhappy ruler. Once word reaches her of Kostao's marriage, she places a, re a regent on the throne and heads to her palace near the Persian capital to be near Kostao. I want to pause here because in a lot of the story, Shireen shows great agency in what she does. I mean, she runs away from home. She waits for Kostao. But this en entire moment where she is a queen and you know, she has the entire world, her entire country before her, and she c gives that up on the prospect of Kostao, not even the promise of him anymore because he's married now, but on the prospect of him. It's supposed to be this great tragic love story where they're meant for each other but they can never be together. But here, it's kind of a moment where I was thinking, you know, you have so much and, you, and you're great, people love you, she gets rid of taxes, she's a champion of the people, and she gives it up to be near someone she could potentially end up with. 
this will go on to make her a tragic figure because she's so faithful and is faithfulness to a fault. This is her hubris. This is her, you know, downfall. She loves him so much that she can't be happy in any other circumstance. So it does make sense in that respect. But just as a, out of like, looking at it from the outside looking in, it seems like she's giving up a lot for not so much reward. Honestly, I respect that she's still making her own decisions. I don't agree with this decision. But it's just like, wait a little longer. You know, they just got married. They just reconquered the kingdom. And so you just found out, give them like a little bit of time, you know, before you try and like, so discord play your cards a little differently i'm sure he likes you we've really established that he wants to be with you maybe you don't have to go near him to you know seduce him just uh, play your cards like play the long game that's not going to happen really quick and even if it does happen quick you'll probably be mad at him for leaving his wife like that for various other reasons i'm sure <laughs> i don't know because now does hear of she's closeness in proximity and being you know the lovable faithful guy he is he totally. asks his wife to let her be a slave in the palace which is kind of <sighs> insulting to someone who is literally just a queen but miriam says she would kill shireen if she ever saw her and at this point it's important to note that there had been love stories written about them songs written about them so the love story of shireen and Christau is known between people it was one of the reasons um, he had, had to leave the kingdom the first time was because his rival for the throne had made it sound that he had gone mad with love for Shireen, that he wasn't going to worry about the people, he wasn't going to be a good king. And so this has been used against him. Miriam is now the queen and she's listening to her husband ask her to make his great fabled romantic lover <laughs> into a slave. And her reaction, justifiably, is I'm going to kill her if you bring her into this palace. So I, I'm not hating on Miriam. I think no. it's a rock and a hard place. She didn't choose to marry Christelle. It was a political deal. It was one of those political marriages where he, it was a, an alliance that was made between the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Emperor. And so it was all politics. There wasn't any love there, really. But it's an insult to have your father say, you cannot marry anyone else. And then hear of your husband trying to smuggle his lover into your kingdom. I would be livid. Uh, yeah, yep. So Shirin and Christau do exchange notes via shopper. And Shirin was so insulted at Christau's request to sneak around. She says, is Queen Shirin not as royal as Princess Miriam and Christau? Because it's such a ridiculous request. Why would you ask a queen to be your, like, your slave or your concubine? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, it doesn't make any sense either to leave your kingdom to come on the premise of, you know, being with your lover who is married to someone else. I don't really know yeah. what the expectation here was. I know, okay, I know this is from way back, way, way back when, and notes make, sending notes make sense because that's the only way to communicate. But honestly, all I can think of when I read this was them sending notes to each other was being in elementary school, trying to sneak notes to people, like in class. <laughs> And you just look at your friend and be like, hey, can you, can you send it to the, the, the cute boy over there? Uh, I want him to know I like him. <laughs> like getting a note back MVP saying, like, story. no, ew, girls have cuties. <laughs> or trying to send a note. Well, in reality, this is trying to send a note to, like, the cute girl that's, like, halfway across the room. But your girlfriend intercepts it and rips it up <laughs> and goes, uh, excuse me, I'll kill both of you. Um, it's just, it doesn't make any, like, Yeah. <laughs> So Shireen uh, has traveled all this way, given up her kingdom, given up her people, to be told that, you know, Christa will sneak around with her. So she is very, very unhappy. And her palace is in a very ill-fated place where she can't keep any livestock, she can't really grow anything, and she longs for fresh milk. So Shalper, being our MVP of this story, commissions his friend Farod to construct a contraption to get milk from the mountains to flow down to her palace. Do you think where her palace is built on has any symbolism to the situation we're in at all? The fact that nothing's growing here or can live here at all? Her palace does make a good symbol because when she had first come to the Persian capital, um, Kostal had commissioned all his slaves to you know treat her with respect, build her a palace if she was unhappy there. And so 
When she got there, she didn't really like the palace in the city, so she asked for a palace to be built somewhere with lots of greenery. And her expectation was that the, you know, the slaves and the servants would listen to her because she was a princess and, from, and had the royal seal from the prince. And so she had commissioned her own palace to be built somewhere very green, very lively, in the mountains. And the servants were very jealous of how beautiful she was and this entire affair between her and Clistow. And so when they built her the palace, they built her the palace in the hottest area they could find, outside the city, and it was nothing like she had asked for. So she was absolutely miserable the first time she was there. And at that point, I think this does become kind of a symbol of her relationship with Rousseau. The expectations when she got there were that she was going to be his wife, she was going to be this, they were going to be these great lovers together, they were going to be really happy together. And it's other people that had kept them apart. Uh, it were people that were close to Rostau, obviously they were his servants. They gave her this place where she couldn't make anything grow and she wasn't happy. But it's also important to note that she chose to come back to this place after she had become queen of Armenia. So they had built her this really crappy palace and she wasn't happy there. But she knew the second time around when she got there that this was going to be the situation. There was no, the first time she was naive, she was young, she was in love, she had, you know, this romantic gesture in her mind. The second time when she makes this journey, after she gives up her throne, she knows exactly where she's going, she knows what the conditions are like, she knows she's not welcome, she knows her, her lover is married. So everything that's happening now is a product of her own agency. And agency is always something that we talk about in terms of people making choices and mm -hmm. you can make choices and sometimes those choices don't work out really well and sometimes they work out you know perfectly for you but in this case she made the choice to come here and she made the choice to be here and now she wants fresh milk yeah as you do i mean i imagine her in her palace under a pile of blankets and just kind of poking her head out being like i want warm milk me <laughs> So Farad agrees to build this canal for her, and when he meets her, he becomes so entrapped by Shireen's beauty, he finishes the task and begins wandering the desert, calling her name. He writes poems and letters about her beauty, and he proclaims his love for her. News okay. of the mad lover of Shireen spreads, and a jealous Christau confronts Farad, promising him Shireen's hand if he builds a road through the mountain pass. Farad works like an absolute madman and tirelessly goes about the task, gaining more and more recognition including from Shireen. Shireen does go and visit him, and it is said that her horse grew tired, so he carried both of them down the mountain. Is the canal that he was originally building, was the milk going to flow down that? Like, are they consistently going to have milk? Is that like a milk river that's coming down? That doesn't seem, like, sanitary or efficient, <laughs> or how are they consistently getting the milk down? I, I have questions. The idea was the farmers that lived on the mountainside, they would, you know, milk their cows as they usually do, and then they would empty the buckets into the canal and it would come straight down to her palace. So she would always have a fresh supply of milk whenever she needed it. Okay, so it wasn't like we're a river type deal where we're consistently going to have that. It's just, okay, no, he, makes she sense. She wasn't going to flood her palace with milk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second question. You said Farad wandered the desert and was mad in love so he wrote poetry and everything it was all beautiful i awed it was great <laughs> how many people are just wandering the desert bumping into him is this a this doesn't sound like a big desert then if he's just wandering and people are bumping and go hey Fahard, how you doing man oh still in love i see great we'll pass the word along because that's what we do here apparently <laughs> The idea of wandering or mad lovers is a, quite a common one in Ganjavi's work, but also in the writer genre of Persian romance. The idea of wandering or lost lovers that had been overcome with some kind of madness is quite a common trope in romantic fiction or romantic poetry in the Persian genre, mostly because it seemed that they had this kind of idea that love and passion were the same size of the coin as destruction. So when you could be mad in love, you could destroy yourself, you lose all sense of what is right, what is wrong, where to go, you lose the will to live in some sense without your lover. 
And so you see this also in Ganjavi's other poem, Leila and Majnun, where Majnun literally means madness. And he travels the desert as well, just kind of wandering around. And he also proclaims his love. And the reason why people would call them, like people would have access to these poems, is that they would either write them down and share them. They would be spoken poetries. You know, you would meet up with other groups as you're traveling and you would, you know, have a dinner with them. You would have a meal with them and you would share your stories and you would share your poetry or your music. Mm -hmm. and a lot of it would spread around and so if you hear news of you know this crazy mad lover that's wandering the desert and he's pining for his love the princess Shireen that would tend to spread because it's about someone famous as well you know the princess Shireen who you know a couple years ago there were stories about her and the current king and so it kind of becomes kind of like it's it's like tabloids but in a weirder way (laughs) It gets bigger than itself because as more people start talking about it, it starts to spread as gossip. It's celebrity gossip in some sense as well as Princess Shireen is a princess and the king is there. He becomes kind of this romantic character to the people as someone who is willing to do whatever it takes to get his his lover. Hmm. Eventually, this does spread back to Costao, who is insanely mad with jealousy because he hears of her visit and he sees that Farol is close to completing this impossible task he sets out for him. He's trying to be cunning as opposed to just killing Farad, who has now become kind of this hero to the people. He sends a messenger to inform Farad of Shireen's passing. Without a second thought, Farad throws himself off the mountain and is dead. A moment of silence for the fool who threw himself off the cliff. There are some stories where, you know, he hits himself with his axe. There are some where he, you know falls off the mountain, then falls onto his axe. There's a lot of different versions of it, but the end of the thing is he kills himself because he assumes that his lover is dead. And he doesn't want to live in a world without her. Please, dear travelers, if you ever hear of a loved one dying, please get some confirmation of it from another source. Honestly, at the rate, like, messengers keep having to go back and forth. They're probably, like, another, like, week before he's able to actually get confirmation. So it just seems... Still, we're talking about <laughs> drastic measures here. <laughs> he's a tragic figure he does something everything he does is in passion it's in love he's again the idea of madness he's crazy in love and when we say that we don't just mean like oh my god i like him he's he lost his mind and so that comes with the same coin as i love him i'll die for him and they actually do it they will die for their lovers and the story of farad and shirin is a shorter version of the entire poem in which Farad is actually the hero and the lover. As so, he should be. As he, well, I mean, he seemed like a decent dude. I, I'd i be rooting for him. I guess, yeah, we don't know enough about him to see if he was actually... He could have been <laughs> disgusting as well, I suppose. He wasn't around long enough to, to get that bad reputation. Bad reputation. <laughs> so Farad is dead, but fear not, because soon after, Queen Miriam dies, and Christelle marries Shireen at last, and they live happily ever after. Yay! Or so we would think. Aww. His wife dies. Chastel thinks, maybe I should go figure out what Shireen's doing. Instead, he spends two years seducing another woman called Shikat and marries her. Wait, what? What? Wait, no, no, no. You mean Shireen, right? She's in the title. What do you mean? Nope. What do you mean? Nope. He decides that he's sitting at his court one day and he goes, well, I should probably go marry Shireen, but... Hey guys, who's the who's the hottest girl in the Persian Empire? All the men tell him, like, you know, there's this lady called Shikar and she's so hot, you should go see her. And he goes, yeah, I might as well. And he goes and she turns out to be, you know, very cunning, very smart. She's elusive and he's like, ah, I love you. And so he marries her. I, I, there was a prophecy you would marry Shireen. You have been obsessed with her from the beginning of this tale. Do we not remember what Grandpa said? Kosro, you were married, Shireen. And you loved her. You went crazy for her. And because a couple of drunk dudes were like, yo, do you want to be crazy? What if you just, like, married that other hot chick? She's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I think it might be because he had this prophecy where it was told that his destined love will be his. He's kind of got this confidence about it where he's like, no matter what I do, she's going to end up with me. There's no repercussions for, you know, gallivanting off and finding this other lady I might, you know, hook up with once or twice. 
he's a jerk about it, but the prophecy does give him this false sense of confidence in his this relationship because it's destined love. It's going to happen no matter what he does. It's in the stars. It's in his fate. He cannot circumvent it no matter what he does. And so to him, everything he does is just leading towards being with Shireen, including, you know, not being with Shireen. It's all part of the master plan. Because of course that's what the master plan meant was, why don't you be with several other women and then maybe you'll get to Shireen. Poor Shireen. She, she doesn't deserve this. Shireen is also very much, woe is me, because she just heard that Queen Miriam dies. She's getting ready for Hussar to come over, propose to her. They can finally be the great lovers they were meant to be. And then she hears news that he's left the kingdom to go and, you know, find this lady. And he goes, she goes, okay. When you find out you're the backup plan. Well, she's like, all right, maybe he's just, you know, on, a, on some, some diplomatic mission. And then he comes back and he's married again. And it's just, it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot to process. It's like that on again, off again relationship, but you're never actually on. You're just constantly almost off. It's Ross and Rachel, but just not as funny. It's just yeah. I didn't, heck? I didn't, I didn't find them funny either. I mean, he's gonna, he's gonna show up to her house and be like, "We were on a break," and she's like, "We were never together." I mean, it was fun to laugh at them because the whole situation was dumb. This is just like, what the heck are we doing here? A hundred percent. Well, news reaches her that a drunk Chusrau, who presumably is now bored with his wife, was on his way to her palace with flowers, and she is livid understandably so for her part shireen prepares a grand welcome you know the tents are up there's exquisite food there's music but she locks the palace doors christelle is forced to stand outside and look up to her on the balcony and ask for forgiveness but all she does is tell him off and he leaves to go back to his hunting party shireen is kind of saying there, coming off the high of what she, her little trashing that she gave him and she immediately regrets this and follows make up your mind oh my gosh <laughs> they have a really weird battle of the bards with the hidden shireen directing her bard to sing about her feelings and how betrayed she felt while the musician barvod sang about Hustra's love and passion for shireen so passionate and loving were the two bards that Hustra gives a moving speech about loving shireen and no one else and she decides to reveal herself to him not wanting to lose her again Hustau signs the marriage contract immediately, and they were married at long last. Yay! Who knew that all it was going to take was a rap battle? Woo! I'm here for it. <laughs> rap battles solve all your problems. We're angry, but let's sing about it. Yes! Disney movies end well because they sing about their problems, and then everyone knows, and they can just it was be happy. It was always a communication issue with these two. They spent so little time actually in each other's company. So much of their so much of their relationship was through messages and secondhand information and you know stories about madmen in deserts and stories about marrying these random ladies. I mean, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> and so I think when they actually had a time to like actually talk about their feelings, sit down, you know, again, through a third party because you know talking to each other face to face is overrated. But having just that intimate moment between each other and realizing this is what I want, they were able to make it work. And good for her for being like, we're getting married immediately because if I let you go off to go get a marriage license, you're probably going to get married to someone else on the way there and back, okay? I know, right? They lived many happy years together. We're not sure if they actually spoke during those couple years. They might have just had a third party. But <laughs> as it happens, fate is fickle and cruel. Or maybe it was karma for Kostrao just being a not-so-good dude. His son by Miriam was a jealous man and coveted his father's throne and his wife. He seized the throne, imprisoned his father, and either executed or exiled his siblings and half-siblings. Rude. Shireen followed her husband voluntarily, and she would stay awake throughout the night to make sure nothing happened to him. On one night, she was so tired she fell asleep. An assassin slipped in, stabbing Christelle. When Sheena woke, her husband was dead, and her stepson was sending her a marriage proposal. Sheen didn't have much of a choice, so she accepted the proposal on two accounts. One, all of Christelle's possessions would be split among the poor, and two, 
the king would be given a grand public funeral. Towards the end of the funeral, Shin waited until she had a moment alone in the royal vault, and she stabbed herself over her dead husband's body. Some will say he woke up to embrace her. Others will say the stars acknowledge the death of such a love. They were buried together, and their story has transformed into a legend. A legend, as Ganjavi will say, for lovers faithful and true, from that time to this very day. Don't know how I feel about that ending line about lovers faithful and true, but otherwise, you know. Faithful and true if you're (laughs) Shireen. She didn't take on anybody, so. We've seen it before with Anthony and Cleopatra's love story. And we see in more modern times the story of Romeo and Juliet where we still have this kind of lovers commit suicide because they can't be together. And it's kind of the star-crossed lovers theme that plays out in a lot of Persian poems and folktales. And here again, we see it with Khosrow and Shirin. Ganjavi's other work, Leilan Majnun, has a similar theme. It's that love that's everlasting to the point where you cannot be alive without your other half. I think this is a fun story. When I was reading it, All I could think about was 20 different long-running TV series I've seen in the past, I don't know, number of years, where the main characters are like, will they, won't they? And on some level, we know that's because they want the show to keep going. There's like a cynical side to why they're just not getting together. But there is something about it that it always happens. There's a reason we keep wanting to watch that again. There's something about this idea of lovers who are meant to be together, but there's always something that just kind of pulls them apart. There does seem to be something about that resonates with a lot of people, that idea that the person you really like, even though things keep coming apart, like you might end up with them still. And it can be really sweet. And sometimes it's just, what are you doing? (laughs) Again, I think it's that same side where Persian poets have love and destruction on the same coin. And as we talked about before, in terms of the love of Aphrodite and the hate of Aphrodite, it's the same kind of situation where you have either something that's going to work out and become great and become a legend and a story, or you have something that's going to just be a tragedy. And the story of Farod and Shirin is almost a one-sided love story. And in that one, you kind of root for Farod because like, will they, won't they? Will he do it? Will it happen? And in the end, it, it doesn't happen. But Some part of you does think if he had been left alive, but he had kept trying, maybe would have happened. And so it it always ends up in either they end up together and it becomes a confirmation that destiny is true, or it becomes a confirmation that fate is cruel and your supposed lover was never actually supposed to be yours. As it was written the stars for Shireen and Kasrao to end up together, so it was written that we need to do our five fantastic finds. Number one. This story fits the definition of the often controversial genre of romantic epic, whereas an earlier rendition of the story, which was in the Shahnameh, is a traditional epic. In a traditional epic, we have a long, grand, majestic tale that focuses on a hero character over a series of incredible events. While many focus on a single hero, they sometimes will focus on a history of a nation or a particular lineage, kind of like uh, an origin story. In the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings, we see Khosrau as a king and a leader, with his personal exploits taking a backseat to the grander themes of his life. Some modern examples we can look to are Samurai Jack, most Fire Emblem games, and The Godfather, just to name a few. Additionally, if you hear of a space opera or high fantasy stories, they are also epics within specific subgenres. Space operas are science fiction flavored a la Star Wars, and high fantasy is, well, fantasy as seen in Lord of the Rings or the Game of Thrones series. Number 2. Shireen's character is the most widely diverse throughout the different versions of this work. As the story has evolved and spread throughout the world, she has become more than just her historical counterpart. The earliest account of her is from a letter inscribed by Khosrau, where he refers to her as his Christian wife, Shira. In fiction, she shifts from a perfect wife, to a champion of Christianity, to the femme fatale archetype. In the Shahnameh, she is described as a Persian woman from Khuzestan, but the Khuzestan Chronicle places her as an Aramean. She is a concubine to the prince and rises to power when he becomes king. She poisons the queen Miriam and becomes the chief wife. 
After Gustav's execution, she poisons herself in his grave. Shireen is described akin to the Perika, the petties of Zoroastrian mythology who are women created by the devil Ahriman to lure men away from the righteous cause. In Ganjavi's tale, she is a sympathetic character, loyal to a fault and faithful while her lover gallivants between lovers. The shift from Shireen as a cunning concubine to a loyal princess can be somewhat attributed to the reign of Khosrau's grandson, Shah Yazgurd III, who claimed Shireen as his adopted grandmother and used it as a stabilizing factor in his claim to the throne. There are lots of fantastic scholarship on the role of matrilineal memory as a legitimizing tool in dynastic politics. Specifically here, we see Shireen be used to characterize her faithfulness and loyalty. Number three, a reoccurring thing that is mentioned frequently in texts is that Khosrau is a good ruler throughout the whole tale. Sure, he has his moments of selfishness and some villainous character spread lies about him, but for the most part, he is a good ruler, just and loved by his people, making Khosrau a unique example of the good king archetype. The good king archetype is virtuous, wise, and all around the kind of guy you would want to be king. The king cares greatly for the well-being of every subject in his kingdom. However, it's actually rare for the protagonist to be this archetype from start to finish. Many princes will end up in this role at the end of their quest, but usually the good king will be a mentor figure, or he'll die early on to effectively signal to the reader that the status quo has shifted for the worst. Think of Mufasa from The Lion King as a good example of this traditional archetype. He is a wise and good ruler who seems to be loved, but dies early on in the story to show evil is gaining power and Simba must rise up to face that evil. In Final Fantasy XV, Prince Noctis' father dies as soon as you finish the tutorial section, essentially inviting great evils into the world for your characters to kill. Number four. Stories change and evolve as we hear them and retell them. The original story of Khosrau and Shireen evolved and became a spin-off series on Farod and Shireen. Great love stories were written about the two, and the story became more and more convoluted over time. In this story, Shireen is often an afterthought, with her feelings more or less backstage, the tragedy that is the life of Farod. Farod is a strange character of Ganjavis that goes against her tradition of kings and warriors being at the forefront of stories. Farod is a simple stonemason and his love for Shireen is purer than the king's and has no distinction of class. His labors and love are selfless and highlights the crazed love madness that is a staple of Persian romance poems. Unlike Shireen and Khosrau, Farod is a mysterious character because there is no real historical fact to prove that he was, in fact, a real person. There is the famous carving titled Farod Tarosh on the Mount Behistun in Iran that has been attributed to him but this is controversial due to the amount of speculation. It's kind of like a speculative chicken or egg situation. What came first, Farod or the engravings? Number five. Ever have a dream that feels like more than just a dream? Like it's a glimpse into the future? Well, neither have I, but Krasrau knows exactly what that's like. He had a prophetic dream that he would get all of the best stuff, and turns out that came true in the end. The idea of dreams telling the future is an old idea that's been around forever, and it's still frequently used today. This is a great way to foreshadow coming events with little hand-waving, since it pretty much is a given that dreams and storytelling always have deeper meanings to them. Oftentimes, these dreams are restricted to only magic users like in Cardcaptor Sakura or Merlin. Other times, they begin to appear to our chosen heroes since the story knows it will revolve around them soon, much like Firestar from the Warrior series. For Sakura and Merlin and Firestar, these dreams were worrisome, as it usually told of coming troubles. But Elphaba from the play Wicked has a dream of Ozian's one day having a day all about her, which is exciting to her. Which of course sounds great until of course we realize that it will eventually be a day of celebrating her ultimate death. Fox, do you love me? Do you love me as much as this love story showed that love can be strong and beautiful? Yeah, it means I'm going to leave you for the next 10 years and go find someone else to to hook up with. But no, we have another podcast to do next week! (laughs) 
I'll find another podcast buddy, and then I'll come back to you. It'll be my backup podcast. And then we're going to have a bard off. We'll have, we'll have a rap battle. Rap battle, Fox versus Sparrow. They were like the OG diss track, basically. Oh my gosh. I would have do- loved to see that happen. <laughs> But also them trying to talk them into it, because they're essentially coming up with this idea of a, of a rap battle. Like, no, no, no. I want you to tell them how I feel, but in song form. Uh, what that come across as kind of weird? You just don't know. <laughs> start it singing. It will be beautiful. Now start singing. Well, dear travelers, we might not be star-crossed lovers, but we sure do host an epic podcast with some very sweet listeners. If you want to hear more from us and find out what our next tale will be, come join us anytime on Twitter at From Enchanted or Instagram at Tales from the Enchant Forest. Or if you're old school like Sparrow, you can email us at Tales from the Enchant Forest at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your questions, comments, and suggestions, so if you have anything to share, please don't hesitate. And remember, travelers, if you enjoyed what you heard today and what we do here, please give us a review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. It helps the podcast grow and reach new travelers to join us on these adventures. Thank you so much, travelers. And remember, there's always a place for you in the Enchanted Forest. And sometimes, if you stick around long enough, you might hear some bloopers. Us? Make a mistake? <laughs> Never. Now, Nizami was the reason why this poem was popularized, but he had many great literary... Literary. I said literally. <laughs> literally. Oh, He's got a lot of great this literal is... literary lits. <laughs> 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 Well, neither have I, but Kurosho knows exactly what's going Did I just call him Kurosho? Kurosho. I was like, with the, with the Japanese, did you, you <laughs> Japanese just <his> name? <laughs> Amazing, Kurosho. We just make it up names now. <laughs> In Final Fantasy XV, Prince Noctis' father dies as soon as you finish the tutorial section essentially inviting great evils into the world for your characters to kill. And you might very annoyingly die because new enemies come out of nowhere and you just keep dying and you're wondering, how do I move on to the next section? I'm not frustrated with the game right now. It's just annoying. I got that part out, but I needed to vent that. Amazing. <laughs> this this cut really close to home when I was like just played this and I can't leave like I just finished the tutorial section like this is such a great game he died and now everything sucks and I can't move forward Aww. <laughs> I'm so mad <laughs> anyways continue <laughs>